By the turn of the 20th century, Santa Barbara had experienced the industrial advances brought on by the railroad and in 1902, the automobile. But a new invention was on the horizon that in Santa Barbara would spur innovations, create new businesses, and begin new industries that would impact the entire world. It was an invention that would provide critical assistance to the war efforts in World War II and provide essential equipment that helped put astronauts on the moon. That invention made its first appearance in Santa Barbara on New Year's Eve, 1910. Well, Santa Barbara's first air exhibition was held out at Hope Ranch. And actually, it started off with a guy named Captain Ivy Baldwin, who was going to come out here and hold an amazing sky festival, as they called it. But then the sweet in the pot, a guy named Didier Masson, also agreed, a French aviator, he agreed to come out to Hope Ranch. So now it was an air exhibition and a duel between these two daring aviators. Though Didier Masson always gets the credit for having the first flight in Santa Barbara, actually, Captain Baldwin flew first. His plane got assembled. And he flew, I think, December 31st, putting his plane together, made a few flights, at nothing for the exhibition, just for testing. And so it was on Sunday, January 1st, and Didier Masson's plane went up and just thrilled the crowds out there. They charged a dollar admission for adults, 25 cents for children. The train trip was 15 cents round trip. So everybody came out there. There was no end of Santa Barbans who wanted the chance to go up in one of these machines. I mean, even though they're crashing and killing passengers and killing the pilots, the mayor was gonna go up on Monday. A reporter for one of the newspapers, a female, offered to go up on the plane. And so, you know, everybody wanted to go with a dashing young Frenchman. On Monday, January 2nd, he took off from the Hope Ranch Field for the second day of the exhibit. And this time he flew way high, did like 3,000 or more feet and people are watching him seeing go out of sight. Meanwhile, on the ground, every kid with a bicycle, every motorist is following this airplane. Where is he going? What is he doing? Well, he went down and buzzed the tower of the Potter Hotel, scared the bejesus out of the people that were up on the deck on top there, buzzes by the tower, banks out over Stern's Wharf, turns around and comes back, heads towards the Potter. Now there's palm trees along Cabrillo Boulevard back then. So he just clips the palm trees and lands on the front lawn of the Potter Hotel. The people just go ballistic. They come streaming out of the hotel. They pull him out of the airplane. They're toasting him with champagne. I mean, he just got a rock star's welcome to the Potter Hotel. Looking at how much room he had to land on that front lawn, this guy was, uh, well, you want to say nuts, brave, I'm not sure, but daredevil for sure to try and land that plane. And it is said that he was dragging his feet to help slow it down as he went across the front lawn. The flight of Didier Masson stirred the imagination of many in Santa Barbara. Among those were two brothers poised to establish a legacy that continues on today. Now, a lot of people have heard about the Lockheed Aircraft Company and the famous Lockheed Skunk Works that developed some of the top secret planes. Don't think too many people know that Lockheed had their start here in Santa Barbara. They were raised here as young boys for quite a while, so they understood Santa Barbara. Their shop was in the William L. Russ garage, which they rented part of at 101 State Street. The start they had here in Santa Barbara actually goes back to 1891, when their mother, Flora Haynes Lockheed, came to Santa Barbara with her husband and lived up in Mission Canyon for a while. And the story is often told that the populace would say, look at those Lockheed kids, they're always down at the beach flying kites. Their first airplane of anything was a, was a homemade what they called Model G seaplane. And their seaplane was different than most seaplanes. Most seaplanes that you think of today have a hull. They made a essentially a big floating platform and mounted the plane on top of that. And that was the, the secret because they could come up on a ramp with that kind. Whereas most seaplanes have to come down in quiet water and then put on a dolly and pull up. Now there's certain people wondering why was it the Model G? And Lockheed later had said that it was because, well, if we said Model A, they would have thought it was our first one. So we wanted investors to think we have been doing this for a while. So Model G, this is our seventh model. When they built the airplanes, they had to get it to the beach. So they took the planes down State Street to Cabrillo, turned west, and in 1914, there was a huge storm in Santa Barbara, wiped out the old wooden bulkheads, the city built concrete wall, which is still existing down there, and it ended at Castile, because Castile was the way for people with horses 
to get onto the beach. The Parks Commission said, well, you know, this ramp is gonna make people on horseback have to do a 50-foot detour around the ramp. And I'm kind of thinking, you're on horseback, what is a 50-foot detour gonna do to you? Well, the community, of course, was behind it, and various people raised money to help the Lockheeds put their ramp in. And the idea was that trying to drag this airplane across the sand was very hard. It took some 20 men to get a plane up there. But on the wooden ramp, one guy could do it. The Flying A was also here at that time. And there's a number of uh, newsreels that were shot and stills that were shot of the Flying A actors and actresses going down, taking rides on the airplanes. It was kind of a case of helping each other because the Suddenly, the Flying A studios had the ability to take airplane photos from the air. And so it was a big deal, and it made money for the Lockheed people and got them the ability to make movies showing uh, all kinds of shots from the air. Their top star, Mary Miles Minter, christened the airplane when it was on its initial voyage down the ramp, she broke a bottle of spring water which might be Santa Barbara's very own Veronica Springs mineral water that she broke over the fuselage. The plane took off and it was a great success for the Lockheed brothers. The first passenger at the Lockheed seaplane down at the West Beach was a man named Pevro Meggs. And we recognized the Meggs because we have Meggs Road, which of course led to Mr. Meggs Farm. And so Mr. Meggs was the first passenger on the Lockheed plane. And the second passenger was his daughter, Leonora. One of the early employees for the Lockheed company was a man named John Northrup. And so John Northrup was a Santa Barbara High School grad of 1913. And as far as I know, he didn't have any training beyond that. Yet in 1916, he went to work for the Lockheed Brothers and he was their primary engineer. And he said the Lockheed Brothers really didn't know anything about engineering. Yet somehow he had a natural ability, I guess, to do this thing because he designed certain wing factors and the shapes of the airplanes. And in fact, it could be said, among the many Santa Barbara firsts is the first wind tunnel. And there's a story that Northrop had a large glass tube and he would put various experimental parts in there, take a couple puffs off a cigar and blow it into the tube to see how the air flowed over the wings. Although Allen and Malcolm Lockheed seemed poised to help the United States war efforts in the First World War, fate would dictate a different path for the brothers. Eventually, the aftermath of World War I led to the demise of their Santa Barbara airplane manufacturing enterprise. After World War I was over, the government released all kinds of jennies for $300 each, brand new, with the engines and the crates, etc. And eventually the Lockheeds were just taken out of business because everybody was giving rides at much lower prices and you didn't have to come to the harbor, you could go anywhere. They eventually converted their seaplane to a land-based plane and tried to then grab everybody's attention by having a transcontinental flight, but it ended sadly in Arizona. There was a crash, so they trucked everything back to Santa Barbara, converted the plane back again to a sea-based plane. And so they gambled the last of their money on a plane called the S-1, which was really a John Northrop aircraft that went up started to revolutionize how airplanes were made because they used a molded wooden lamination to mold the body. They got around all the wires and cables that held everything together. So Northrop's designs were very beneficial for the Lockheed Brothers for the planes that they were building at the time. Eventually, they all parted ways. Um, the Lockheed Brothers folded, and, folded their Santa Barbara operation their airplane was attached by a company called local company called Archer and Callis, and the plane was towed across the boulevard to a vacant lot, and it sat there for quite a while. Yes, I do have the Lockheed propeller off the F-1 uh, flying boat. I got it from Haphazard, who was a very well colorful bicycle shop proprietor here in Santa Barbara when I was growing up. And um, it was given to me by Hap because uh, he went out to the airport one day and was standing at the airport uh, on the sidelines there on the flight line and my dad was there with his staggering beach and um, saw Hap and said, hey, do you want an airplane ride? And so my father gave him an airplane ride in a staggering and uh, he never forgot that and he thought my dad was such a great man for giving him this ride so um, he wanted to uh, do something nice for me. And he said, you know, would you like to have this propeller? I've been saving it all these years. It came off Lockheed Seaplane. 
And of all those early Lockheed airplanes, none of them exist, just the photographs. And we do know that their F-1C plane, the big twin-engine one, was eventually just burnt across the street from the launching ramp. Right after World War I, a number of um, private fields were started, mostly on ranches and farms. Uh, all the way from uh, Carpentry up to the Gleda Valley. Including the cow pasture in Hope Ranch where Didier Masson began his historic flight and the Lockheed's first airport in the sea, there were a total of 13 landing fields in the Santa Barbara, Carpentaria, and Goleta area. The Corona Del Mar airfield that stretched from the end of Milpa Street to the Bird Refuge, the Rice Hunt Moor field where the Milpa Street exit off the 101 freeway is now, the Low Flying Field on the Mesa, the Chadbourne Dones Field, later the Carpinteria Airport, the Pomato Landing Field off Glen Annie Road in Goleta, and Parsons Field near Highway 150 were all active for many years. Some still remember those early fields. Baylor, who had the airport at that time, he used to let me sit in the airplanes and play like I was flying, you know. And I haven't had it occasion to meet Lindbergh and I had occasion to meet Jack Holt and all these guys that flew, you know. So I was kind of a regular customer. Several other famous flyers of the day also established their own airfields in the area. Individuals had their own airports. Uh, Earl Ovington, who was a famed, uh, who was the first uh, airmail pilot. Uh, Earl Ovington had property in the Samarkand area where the community golf course is, and so he had a private airfield there. Looking at the Santa Barbara Municipal Golf Course today, it's possible to imagine the main runway of the Ovington Airfield, located on what is now the 11th Fairway. The Ovington Airfield is also linked to another prominent figure in the history of aviation, George Hammond. Earl Ovington actually wrote a letter of recommendation to the um, people that owned Ryan Aircraft, Claude Ryan, asking them to hire my father, who had just graduated from the University of Berkeley. So he worked alongside all of the men when they were building the Spirit of St. Louis and, and had a personal relationship with Charles Lindbergh. In fact, Lindbergh actually sent a postcard to my father saying he was coming to visit, I think it was in about 1938. My father had an airfield out on Hammonds Beach in Montecito, and it had uh, it had about a 1,400 uh, foot runway on it. My dad wanted a place to land his airplane and his sisters wanted a place to practice polo. So the, there was a combination polo field and uh, golf course and landing field, you know. And probably not one of them were perfect, but they were all, considering it was in somebody's backyard, worked out pretty well. He would fly to uh, San Miguel Island to take the mail over to the Lester family, which had a ranching operation on San Miguel Island from the 30, late 20s up until 1941 when the war started. <laughs> Douglas Corrigan actually was a friend of my father's who became famous, I'm not exactly sure what year it was, I think it was in the 30s, by having an airplane in New York trying to get a permit to fly to Ireland, and they wouldn't give him the permit, so he put fuel in it, told everybody he was going to California, and ended up going to Ireland, and called him and told everybody he went the wrong way, so he, uh, we got the nickname Wrong Way Cargan. He actually took one of my father's airplanes from the field in Montecito, and took it down to Carpinteria, where they did some work on it, and then flew it back to Montecito and ground looped it on landing and crashed it. And my dad was always annoyed at, at Douglas uh, Corrigan because he had to pay him to fix it after he wrecked the airplane. My dad lived at a very interesting time because he learned to fly in a Jenny and his last airplane was a twin engine jet. So uh, it was a pretty interesting time in aviation. We certainly aren't gonna see that again. And he was also born before the uh, Wright brothers flew and was alive when they landed on the moon. <laughs>